So good morning. We're actually going to be looking at week five of the reading um, section of level two of English. Now we're going to be looking at using reference materials. Now I've got a couple of images to show you um, what we're doing. I think Vivian's having audio issues. Can you just give me one moment? I'll uh, try and fix that for her. I'll ask her to dial in. I should really make a note of this number. Let's see. Is it? It's Fantastic. Brilliant. So, yeah, we're using uh, reference materials on here. I'll just get onto the PowerPoint. There's a couple of questions that I'll be asking you before we actually make a good start. But I'll go through the aims and so on first. So the aims and outcomes for today, so the end of this session, you should be able to use some reference materials and resources like glossaries and so on on here. So keys and legends and visual aids. Now, do you know what keys and legends are? No. Mm. Nope. no, no idea. Yeah, no idea. I'll tell you actually what they are. So, do you know when you're looking at maps or you're looking at pictures and they've got like little uh, definitions on them or they've got images on them? So, a key, sorry, a legend is something like a caption, a title, or a small explanation. It can be a picture, it can be a cartoon, it can be a poster. It's just something that's showing you what's going on. It might be supporting the written language or it might just be telling you exactly what it is so it's like a, a a mini title a key is like a list so if you've got a load of symbols on something it's a list that tells you what these symbols mean now the easiest way for me to show you is i just popped some images onto a word document just to make it a little bit easier so these are legends and keys let me get my highlight out so these are legends where it says cities under uh, and cities over. They're explaining what these mean. And these little dots, the dot, big small dot, big dot, the circle with the dot in it, this, that means a railroad, all of these are keys. So when you look at a map or when you look at an image and it's got like little images like this or little signs like this, and then it's got a thing explaining it, these are keys over here and these are legends. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you want me to yeah. Yeah. So, so a legend is a caption or a title. So this will be like a legend here. That's a caption title. These are captions and titles. And keys are these little images, little symbols and so on. Just that we're going to be looking. It will, we will look at it in the PowerPoint as well. I just thought it would be nice for you to know at the beginning what they mean. Brilliant. So you're going to use them to find word meanings in different text types. And so you're going to be looking at what they mean in straightforward text and what they mean in complex text. And now you should already be able to use a range of reference materials, uh, resources like glossaries, keys, legends, visual aids, footnotes and endnotes. Now, some of, some of you have actually studied with me for healthcare. So when we were doing the academic research skills unit, you would have already uh, looked at how we uh, look at referencing, how we find different materials and so on. So it's something similar to that, like primary and secondary. For those that haven't been in those lessons, don't worry, we'll go over it. And then you might be able to identify primary, secondary and tertiary sources. So before we go on to the next slide, I just actually want to ask you a question. When you see a word that you don't really understand what it means, or there's a phrase that you don't understand what it means, what do you do to find out? So if I'm not there for you, you're not having a live lesson, how do you find out what a word means? What do you do? So, as a question for all of you. 
dictionary of Google. Mm-hmm. Anything else? So we've got dictionaries, Google. Sometimes I'll go on my phone and I'll ask Siri what something means or what, uh, you know, there, there's a million things that we can actually do. So we've got a whole lot of here. You've got uh, Wikipedia. You've got dictionary, like you said. You can ask okay, a friend. Ask well. Yeah, exactly. You can use a thesaurus. Now, a dictionary and a thesaurus are quite similar. A dictionary just tells you uh, what the word is and what its meaning is. But it's a thesaurus is actually uh, gives you the word you're looking for, but then it gives you alternative words as well. Sometimes you look at a word and you won't understand it, but when you see a word that is similar, has the same meaning, but it's slightly different, you're like, oh yeah, I know that one. You look on the internet, like you said. In some texts, if you've ever looked at uh, textbooks in um, high school, college, and so on, or when you go into university, you'll see that at the bottom of them, they'll have footnotes in them. So little notes at the bottom. You'll have glossaries and then you can also look at the key. So these are some things that you would do. So Vivian, did you get audio? I don't think she's on yet. Yeah. So for in text references, what you're going to look at is a, a text normally has a lot of consistent features, things that you'll come to know to be normal. So you might be reading a book or a textbook. In all these, you'll see that there's a glossary of terms. There's a legend or key. There's visual aids like pictures, graphs, charts. There can be footnotes. So who knows what a footnote is? Where are they normally? Just think of the word foot. It's at the, when you have a piece of writing, it's at the bottom of the work. Yeah? And then end notes. Normally, if you've got, say, uh, a book or an uh, article and um, it's three pages long, an end note will be right at the end of the article or end of the text. So a footnote will be at the bottom of the page, just explaining certain things, and an end note will be right at the back, so when the article or the document has finished. Now, I've also got an image of a glossary. I know you'll probably already know what this is, but I just thought it'd be nice for you to have a visual reminder. So a glossary is, do you know when you open a book and you're not sure of certain words? Or if you've got small children and you help them read um, their um, Oxford Owl books or their Chip and Biff books that they're reading for phonics, you'll see that there's a glossary there for them. It'll be like telling you what certain words mean, like artificial, what does it mean, barometer, what does it mean, what does dense mean. So it just gives you an information about what that particular word means so you understand it. So, a bit of a long one here. Move these out of the way. Yeah, there. So, glossary of terms. So, when we're looking at glossaries, we're going to look at what these actually mean. So, glossaries will normally be there when there's a subject that is special, or there's a field, or there's different things that you're not sure about, and they need definitions to be put in place for them. So, it just defines, it tells you what these mean. Now, We've got this text here about somebody who's making a, a draw and they're cutting pieces to size and they're using particular um, specialized equipment. Oh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to read that. So the front side of the oak drawer was more than three times as long as the height of the side panels that I was planning to make. So I decided to use that to make the adjacent panels, readying the wood by. So he's realized one piece of wood is a bit bigger, and then he's trying to use that as a template. So now he's unscrewing and removing the two drawer handles. He's gently knocking um, the drawer sorry. apart. Yeah? Sorry, please. It's a lot of uh, noise on the background. We can't hear you clearly. So um, can I ask whoever's got the uh, noisy background to mute themselves, please? <laughs> So I'll just go through and see who it is.
Yeah, I think that if, if I've muted you, I'll unmute you later when I ask a question. So this person is making a draw. Now he's uh, using uh, one side to make uh, other sides to, as a template. Now what he's done is he's unscrewed and removed the draw handles. And you'll notice there's bits in red here. So he's gently knock a, knocking the draw apart with a driving baton. And then he's holding it. It's already held together with dove joints. Now, on a normal basis, you wouldn't know what a driving baton is or a dove joint is, which is why you've got a glossary here. So it tells you a driving baton is a small headed hammer. A dove joint is interlocking joint, where it's just pieces of wood that lock together like a jigsaw. And then he's got a mason square. So I wouldn't really know what a mason square is either. So it gives you that in the glossary. So a mason square is a tool for marking straight lines and right angles. Now, in this text, they've highlighted these words that you might not be aware of on a normal day-to-day -day basis, unless you do a lot of building work or you know someone that does a lot of it. So, um, and it's showing you that the explanation here is right next to it in the glossary. So sometimes the glossary will be right next to your text, or it can be right at the end in the back pages. So a key, like I said earlier, is just like a list, a table is explaining what the symbols are. It's normally on maps, but you can find it on like charts and diagrams. So if you're ever doing a, uh, um, a chart um, monitoring, um, say, um, the heat, in every summer for the past 20 years, then you'd probably have a little key next to it explaining what does this color mean, what does this symbol mean, and so on. So it just explains what is. So for this on here, the circle with the number in it tells you what the local routes are, and then the, like, the little flag thing with the number in it tells you that they're the interstate routes. So it just tells you what to decipher this uh, map by. Okay, so text normally they'll have visual aids with them as well. So you might have, uh, you, to be honest, you probably would have already seen this, where you read a piece of text, and even in the homework that we've done over the past few weeks, even last week where we had an article, and it was about a footballer, and there was a picture to go alongside it to show us who the footballer is. It had an image of him. So you'll always have an, in, have an illustration just to reiterate, just to sort out what you're actually looking at. So this text here is, I'm going to read it. So it's about a man who decided to get a little bit more healthy. So riding coast to coast in three days with Alan Smithwick. Now he's called Alan Smithwick. He's talking about himself. So he's aged 40, overweight and single. I decided to turn my life around. A work colleague suggested getting in training to do the annual Susexion, oh, Susexonian 104 mile three day trip from Whitwood in Essex to Winchelsea on the Sussex coast. Now the route as pictured on the right involved a mix of rural beauty and London chaos. It was to change my life. So he's talking about how he's getting healthy. His uh, colleague has told him to do uh, this um, route which is 104 miles over three days. And he saw that it's a beautiful route. Some of it was really nice and picturesque. Some of it was countryside. And some of it was city, London chaos. So he's shown that you can have a piece of text. And to make it a bit more interesting so you can relate to him, you've got this uh, image to go alongside it. So is everyone okay with what we've gone over so far? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we are following. Yeah. So we've got footnotes. So remember, footnotes actually come at the bottom of a page. So you might have um had a piece. When some of you have written assignments for me, you'll see that there's an option where when you're writing your word document, you can add in footnotes. Now in that footnote, you might have put your name in. And uh, you might have put down the uh, unit that you're doing. For example, if it was Ben that did it, he might have put uh, Benedict uh, academic research skills or Benedict person-centered approach. So just to show me that this is his work, 
so I can identify it. So it's got that extra bit of information just at the bottom of a, a document. So these footnotes can be at the bottom of a document. They can just have simple information about who it is that's done the document that you're talking about. So if it's you that's written assignment, you can just put your name on every, it'll come onto every single page that you do. Or it can sometimes have extra things on it. Like it might have a direct quote, it might summarize some information, you might paraphrase some information. So if you're looking at a detailed text about, say, how to uh, make a cake, and it's quite complicated, and the person has told you the recipe, but then and in the footnote, he might have said at the end, to make this recipe easier, add three eggs or swap the butter for oil instead. So it just gives you a bit of information. So another example is it can be detailed like, so here's a bit of info. So it has been argued over and over again that one should pronounce scone in a certain way. However, Neville has recently produced conclusive evidence that it should really be pronounced one way, claiming the original Scottish is with a long O, as in toast. So instead of saying scone, you can say scone. So um, they said it must have been about a particular way that something is pronounced. So they said that even though some people say it can be done in two different ways, this person says that no, scone, scone should be pronounced as scone only in one way. And then it's got the uh, references over here from uh, where they've got this information from. So you've got the first reference here and you've got a second reference here. So the reference, it has the author, the title, the publisher, year of publication, what page it's from. So it's got all of these things onto it. So page 78 to 90, page 56. This is the publisher here. And uh, this is the... And this is the author here. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, let me just get rid of these highlights. There. So end notes are again like footnotes, but they actually come at the end of the text rather than at the bottom of the page. Now, what will this happen is, is normally it'll be at the end of like a, uh, a college or university textbook is where you'll normally see them. They normally have a lot more detail than footnotes. Footnotes are like one or two sentences or a small bit of information. But an end note has extremely highly detailed information in it. It can be lots of pages. It can have lots of references and the notes are quite long. So it's normally authors that want to just go over a bit of information to summarize, to give you a bit of references, a bit of their own opinion. They can put that into end notes. So footnotes at the bottom of a page, end notes right at the back of when the text is finished. And then we've got types of reference materials and resources. So, again, on this, they're already pre-matched, which is a, a bit of a pain, but we'll go over them. So, for example, if we're looking at this, we want to know, is it a footnote? Would it be in there? Would it be in the glossary? Would it be a visual aid? Would it be a key? Or would it be a footnote, which is a direct quote? And then this one would be paraphrased. So, a fair rule, protective cover on the end of a walking stick. So, I don't know what that means. So what does federal protective cover mean? I know what a walking stick is. I know what a cover is, but I don't know what this is. So obviously it would be in the glossary. So that is where I would find out what this word means. The next one is the rise in crim is proportional to the increase in poverty. So obviously they've uh, abbreviated this. They've not talked about why they've abbreviated it. But this is a direct quote because you can see the speech marks there, the inverted commas. So that would be a footnote, but it's a direct quote. And then this here, what is this? What is this image of? 
Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, that should be a key. Yeah, key. it's a key. Mm -hmm. Because it's just, it's got all these symbols. It's got a P, a D, a W, and then it's telling you exactly uh, what these things mean. And then this one here, all changes were due to the decline in traditional forms of mail. However, I feel that, so this is the footnote, but it's also part of, yeah, it's paraphrasing it. So it's telling you that uh, all the changes were due to decline and so on, so on, so on. And then it's telling you how I feel that, so it's paraphrasing details. And this one at the end, easy, it's just a visual aid. It's just there to give you, um, you might have had a document about different charts and graphs or statistics, and this is just letting you know, visually giving you some clarity. <laughs> so we've got types of sources now. Some of you might be already familiar with uh, research sources. You've got primary sources, secondary sources, and tertiary. So I always find that the easiest way to remember this is Primary sources are something that you do that is new, that is an original idea that is done by you first hand, or is done by a friend or a colleague first hand. So uh, where somebody will write a novel or they'll conduct research. Sorry, it's getting a little bit noisy in the background again, if you don't mind muting, please. Just so everyone can hear clearly, thank you. So you have, um, where was that, yep. Yeah. So a primary research or primary resources or sources will be something that you might have picked up a phone and done an interview or talked to a colleague. So again, like novels, diaries, interviews, and so on. And they're all first-hand research, first-hand sources, they're primary. Secondary sources are things that have already happened. They're already available for you. Now, if I want to go and watch a movie in cinema, um, what's out? Peter Rabbit. Number two, I think, is coming out or has come out. If I want to know uh, what that's like, some people might have already gone and watched it, so I'll go online and I'll look at a movie review. So that's something that's already been created for you. I might want to find out um, some information on uh, um, fibromyalgia. What's the sources of pain? Why do some people have a lot of pain and why don't they? I don't want to go and conduct the um, information myself. I don't want to go and spend that much time. I just want to see what information is available. So I'll go on the internet, I'll look at some newspaper articles, I'll look at some biographies, I'll look at some books. These are sources of research or sources of information that have already been done for you. But again, they're not going to be um, the aspect where you're going to get 100% information you're looking for, you're just going to find out what people have already done. And then tertiary sources, these are third sources. And these are just a mix of like primary and secondary sources. So they can be uh, textbooks, they can be Wikipedia where people are putting information down and so on. And now a quiz. So if you all don't mind unmuting yourself, please, I'll unmute anyone that I've put on myself as well. And then I'd like everybody to participate. Yep, fantastic, thank you. So, the answers are here, again, but it's nice if we discuss all of this. So, what is an incorrect way to look up a word? So, in a dictionary, a glossary online, or is there no incorrect way? B. Yeah, there is no incorrect way. You can look up a word any way you like, yes. Because you could ask a friend, you could do any of these things that I hear. You could go in a dictionary, glossary, online, whichever. They're all correct ways. As long as you're finding out what that word means, there's nothing incorrect. So which of the following is not a reference to so key, footnote, back note, glossary, or end note? So which is not a reference tool? Yes, yeah, see, back, it's a, it, yeah. there's, nothing, there's nothing called a back note. There is, we call it an end note, so it's never called a back note. So 
What are you most likely to see? Where are you most likely to see a glossary? So will you see a glossary in an instruction manual, an email, a newspaper article, or an advert? Hey, instruction manual. Yeah. So have you ever had uh, one of those units that you might have gone to IKEA and bought or Argos and bought, and you have a big instructions and it shows you what tools are there? But then it has a little glossary showing you that A is this Allen key, B is this fruit. It has keys and groceries inside there as well. Brilliant. So look at this glossary over here. Let me just see if you can. I know some of you might not be able to see my highlighter, but look at this blue box. Yeah. Over here. So what are, we're going to look at the glossary of terms for the rules of chess. So, which below is an abbreviation? Are we all okay with what abbreviation means? Yeah. Yeah? Mm. So could somebody explain to me what abbreviation means? Make it small, I think. Yes, well done. Yeah, it's where you're getting a word and you're cutting it down, you're making it smaller. So, you've got back rank, bullet chest, KT, mobility, and skewer. Which one is an abbreviation? So KT means, if you look over here, KT is short for night. Brilliant. Well done, everyone. So, let's look at this one again. There's a glossary here to help you. So, which of the below defines an aggressive move? So, which one is an aggressive move? Is it a back crack, a bullet chest, a KT? A mobility or a skewer. Look in this blue box here and then tell me what that is. Yeah, and what, what is a skewer? Attack. An attack on another person. Yeah, fantastic. Well done. Attack on another person. Yes, very good. And then, which of the below shows a player's ability? Back rank, bullet chest, KT, mobility, or skewer? A, back rank. Yeah. So, yep, yeah, it's a player's rank. It tells you what their rank is. It tells you their ability. So, I'm not very familiar with chess, so this is all uh, a foreign language for me as well. But it's nice to have that glossary there to uh, show you what these things mean. So, which of the below shows a piece's ability? First, it was player's. Rank now is pieces ability. So bank rank, bullet chest, KT, mobility, or skewer. Okay, mobility. mobility. Yeah, and what does that mean? D. D. Yeah. Right, and what is the what, is, what does it say in the glossary about that? Ability of a piece to move around the boat. Yes, well done. And then if you saw the symbol on the map. What do you think it would represent? Do you think it's a mosque, a hospital, a reserve, or a historical interest place? Mm, I'll say historical interest. I'm not sure. Yeah, it is a historical interest. Now, right. when you're doing your um, tests, don't worry if you get something like this because you will actually be given a key of what these symbols mean. If you're shown anything about a symbol, they'll give you a key, like what we have, something like that glossary on the side. It'll be a box and it'll show you the picture and it'll tell you what it actually means. So if it's a circle with a dot in it, it'll tell you what that means. If it's a triangle, it'll tell you what that means. Whatever the image is, it will explain. So just make sure you reference to it. Make sure you pay attention to what that key is. Okay. And then what kind of source would you expect an article to be classed as? Would this be primary, secondary, tertiary, or none of them? Secondary. Secondary, yes. Yeah. Because an article is something that's already been yeah. An article is something that's been done for you. So it is yeah, it's a secondary uh, piece of information. If it's you writing that article, you conducting research for it, then it'll be primary, but if it's a newspaper you picked up and it's telling you about um, the restrictions that were meant to be taken off on the 21st of June, but now there's the 17th of July, that secondary piece of information, you're gaining information from someone who's written it down. So almost done. 
So what kind of source would you expect a novel to be classed as? So primary, secondary, tertiary, or non? Secondary. Yeah, secondary. So I loved reading the Harry Potter books, but that's not, and none, it's none of my work. It's me reading everything about her imagination, all that she, J.K. Rowling has done in that book. She's put down her own world, her own imagination. It's straight from her head. It's straight from her brain. So everything that's written in it is secondary information. Is what she's decided to put in. So today, hopefully, you have been able to uh, use reference materials. You'll get a, an understanding of what glossaries are, what keys and legends are. You'll know what visual aids are when you're in your test. This lesson should hopefully have helped you to understand that when you've got a, a glossary or when you've got a, a key or a legend next to you or when you've got a picture next to you, pay attention to them, look at them, see what they're saying, just glance at them and it'll help you answer the questions that you're going to be doing. You'll be able to use them to find word meanings in different types of text so you'll know what a particular word means. Like I didn't know what a fair rule cover was for a walking stick and it just told me on the other side in the glossary. And then you should be able to use a range of reference materials, resources. You should be able to use glossaries and all of these above items, keys, legends, pictures, footnotes, and notes um, to support you when you're reading and writing. And you hopefully will be able to identify what primary resource, uh, sources are, what secondary sources are, and what tertiary is. So a primary is research that is conducted fresh. It's first-hand surveys phone calls, interviews, and so on. Secondary is things that have already been done for you, like when you go on Google, when you go on Wikipedia, when you read a book. And tertiary resources are things that are primary and secondary. They can fall into both categories. So I want to show you the homework on here. Where are we? Activity one. Oops, that's not activity one. Get past it a few times. There you go. So you got these two pieces of homework. This one is quite a nice short one. So you're just going to look at this map and you're going to answer the questions. So there's a map here. You've got a key here, and it will um, tell you. So what is Saint Frieda's? Tell me what Saint Frieda's is. And it should on the map. It should help you. Can somebody tell me what Saint Frieda's is on here? If I underlight highlight it for you. The hospital. <laughs> yes, exactly. So what can it what can be found off more sides more side street? So if you look find more side street on the map and you'll tell me there's a key mm -hmm. yes. on, the, yes. on the right of the hospital. Yes. So it's not yes. asking you where you can find, you find oh. asking what is on more side street. Oh. What's so you've got something so if we look at more side street, it's on the coast guard. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there's more side and there this is telling you that it's a historical site. See, it's quite nice and easy. These are the type of questions you'll have when you're uh, doing uh, your tests. So it's just making sure you read the questions properly. So it's not asking you where is more site, just what, what can be found off. So just make sure you read them properly. Read them twice if you have to, to make sure that you've got the right thing. And then just reference it all over here. So that's the first activity. We've got two activities because they're quite they're not long. And activity two is a bit of reading for you, but from the quality of work that I've been getting, this you're going to be perfectly fine with this. So you're going to read this um, information here, and it's referenced over here as well for you. And then you're just going to answer the question. So who claimed the increase in funding and activity in Kazakh archaeology? What is the Ministry of Cultural Response? So read through it. Read through it twice if you have to. Highlight it. My, what I always say is before, this is something that I always do now. Whenever I'm in a test or whenever I need to read something for information to answer questions, I will actually read the questions first. So while I'm reading, when I know what the questions are, then I can go back and read the information and then it helps it set into my brain, oh, this is what I was looking for. So it gives you a good idea and then you can go back for each question and go from there. 
Now, another rule that they do in these tests is, from all my time in um, looking at these tests, is they'll do it in order. So the answer for number one will be first. Answer for number two will be second. You know, they'll follow on. They're not going to be like, this is the last paragraph and this is the first paragraph. They normally follow on in the order, just to make it simpler for you. So these two homeworks, I've already emailed them to everyone. Um, I've uh, added Ben and Vivian on as well to my email list, so you should have um, those also. Yeah, Wait. I got it. Did you get okay. it? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Fantastic. Yeah, I emailed about an hour before. Um, I think so. If you sorry, if you just excuse me for one moment. Mm -hmm. I thank you for that. So if you get these in for me by Monday, if possible, um, then I can mark them and I'll get them back to you uh, on Monday evening or Tuesday morning, depending on when I receive them. I've got, I've got, I've got. Fantastic. Okay, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'll send out the code for tomorrow's lesson shortly as well. All right, thank you. 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 Thank you.